Have you ever found yourself in the midst of playing Resident Evil 2 for the original Sony PlayStation and marveled at its gorgeous pre-rendered backgrounds that breathe life into the expansive network of scenery for the game? Or, or maybe Castlevania Symphony of the Night and were awestruck at its beautifully parallax background layers and sprite work? Let me take it a step further. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, how great would it be if I could use some of those sprites or backgrounds for my own purposes? Well if, you made this, well, if you made it this far into the video, either out of pure interest in the topic, you know, being the great fifth generation retro gaming enthusiast that you are, or maybe you're someone at their wits end trying to extract sprites from their favorite PlayStation game but to no avail, allow me to introduce you to this niche world of ripping image data from the original Sony PlayStation um, so that you too can get your hands on these coveted sprites and textures that have long since eluded your grasps. Alrighty then, so let's get into the breakdown. This section of the video is going to be dedicated to introducing some of the tools and libraries that we're going to be using to assist us in extracting image data from a PlayStation ROM. So I want to make sure that no matter what platform you're on or no matter what your skill level is, we're all using the same tools and you can follow along to me, you know, in the comfort of your home and, you know, if you're in Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever the case may be, right? And then I'm also going to introduce you to my roadmap. This is going to be my pace of progression for all of the level changes of difficulty in scenarios that we can find ourselves in, in abstract in um, extracting PlayStation 1 image data. Now, what do I mean by that? So on the next slide here, I have um, my little roadmap here that I've made. Looks kind of scuffed, but it is what it is. So if you look here, this is the easy um, level of difficulty. This is the most ideal scenario that we can find ourselves in while extracting image data from a PlayStation 1 ROM. So as you can see here, I used some little Mario pipes to represent, you know, the level of difficulty. And essentially this pipe here, as you can see compared to the others, is unobstructed and unobscured. It means that we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the data that we found on the CD-ROM being in the format that we wanted in, in a very easy standard format for us to be able to look at these images and convert them to whatever file format that we want. We're going to eventually get onto the medium level of difficulty. So this is where things can start to take a slight turn. It's not necessarily overly difficult. It just means that it's not exactly how we want the data to be represented, but it's still something that should be very easy. For example, in medium, instead of storing it in individual files, it may be um, the image data may be stored in a more archival format, right? In some sort of zip, right? If you can think of what an archive format is. And the hardest level of difficulty is where, you know, shit really hits the fan. This is DEF CON 2. This is when everything is going wrong. And the developers did a really good job at making sure that, you know, random people 30 years down the line weren't able to easily look at their sprites and textures that I'm sure the graphic designer spent many hours on. However, even then, I'm going to, you know, do my best to still take them. Sorry to those people, right? Alrighty, so the three primary tools that we're going to be using to assist us today are going to be a hex editor, an image library, and a disk image extractor. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what a hex editor is, um, it is essentially a tool or a program that will allow us to view the contents of any sort of file in a binary format, particularly in the hexadecimal um, numerical system. That's why it's called a hex editor. Now, again, once we find image data, it is going to be very convenient to be able to open it up and be able to analyze the contents of the file, just to make sure that we're reading what we think we're reading. Now, a disk image extractor is how we're going to view the file system of a PlayStation 1 ROM. So the PlayStation 1 ROM is essentially on a standard CD using the ISO 9660 standard. So any sort of disk image extractor is going to allow us to view the file layout of a PlayStation 1 ROM. So we can see file extensions, executables, and really all of the data contained inside of, you know, a very easy, simple layout, right? And lastly, we're going to be reliant on an image library. So this is going to convert the TIM image data into some sort of format of a modern image file, right? That modern image viewers and modern operating systems natively support, right? That being BMP, you know, JPEG, PNG, or whatever the case may be, right? So in regards to the tools that we're going to be using, so the hexadecimal editor, right? So you can really use any one that you want, but if you're on a Windows like me, I like to use HXD. Now, unfortunately, it's only available on Windows. Um, I've already checked here. 
and it's only available for the Windows family of operating systems, which is very unfortunate. But again, any hexadecimal editor that will allow you to view the content you know, of a file is good. So you don't have to use HXD, but if you want to follow along with me, just know that I'll be, you know, not doing anything fancy. So you don't need to be using um, HXD, but that's just the one that I use. Um, for the image library, I actually created one myself. Shameless plug, right? It's called the Adaptive um, Graphics Image Display Library, or Agital for short. Now, um, all of what we're going to be doing in this video, I already have examples of how to do these things. So as you can see here, I already have tools set up that allow me to extract data from a PlayStation 1 ROM. So if you want to skip this tutorial entirely, I mean, these are going to be here regardless, right? Just in case, or if you're having trouble implementing it yourself in whatever language. So Agile was programmed in the C programming language, and I have everything that you'll need here. So I have the library here, right? I have the um, header files, the source files, some example programs um, that will show you how to convert between different file formats. These are the images that are supported. Tim, you know, the Tim image file format for the PlayStation 1 being a core feature of Agile. And for this image extractor, I'm going to be using AnyBurn. Now, again, I, I, I'm, I think, okay, so this is available for Linux at the very least. It's available for basically for Windows and Linux. Again, you don't need um, to be using AnyBurn, you know, in order to do it. I mean, you can look at Mac OS versions, right? So if we have a disk image extractor um, Mac, I'm sure you can find something very easy that'll let you open up ISOs, right? How to view them. You can probably find something very easily for yourself. But those are the tools that we're going to be using for today's video. Alrighty, so let's get into the Baja, the meat and potatoes of this video. Let's discuss our methodology for how we're going to extract image data from a PlayStation 1 ROM for the software developer's perspective. Now, what is the most ideal scenario, level one, ground zero, of how to extract this image data? Well, that would be when all or most sprites and textures are stored in Sony's Tim image file format. And this is also damn near a pipe dream because it is extraordinarily rare for a PlayStation 1 title to just contain, you know, files on files with a .tim extension to indicate that it's a Tim image file for us to view in plain sight. Usually they're stored in um, a much more sophisticated format where they definitely are stored in like complete Tims, but it's not just going to be rows and rows of, you know, Tim extensions. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, what is a Tim image file? Well, simply put, a Tim image was the most common, not the only, but by far the most common and utilized among PlayStation 1 retail titles, and the most common graphics file format designed by Sony, you know, to hold, you know, graphics data that could be directly pipelined to the PlayStation 1's GPU. So the Tim image file has attributes that directly align it with the PlayStation 1's VRAM and is formatted as how a lot of the graphics primitives, you know, like textures are. You know, that's how the Tim is formatted. It's very similar to that of the PlayStation 1 um, um, textures inside of the GPU, how it stores its memory. Now, the Tim image could be index colored or directly colored, right? And it was a little Indian ordered. So here is a high level overview of what a Tim image looks like. So here we have the Tim header, as far as I'm concerned. These um, two variables are going to always be contained inside of a Tim. Now, depending on what this version number is, it's going to branch off as to how you could potentially end up reading the data, but these two numbers are going to be contained in any file that dare call itself a TIM. So this magic number is essentially the identification number. This is going to always be contained in the front of a TIM. So as you can see here in hexadecimal notation, it's essentially OX10, the number 16. All right, so you see 10, followed by three pairs of zeros. This is a good indication in any file that you're analyzing that if you see the, you know, this number here, it's a good indication that it could potentially, not that it is, but it has a very good chance of being a Tim, especially when you're aware that it's, when it's PlayStation 1, you know, data, right? So the version number could be two, three, eight, or nine, and here's how it would look like in hex. So whenever you're in a hexadecimal editor, this is what you need to look out for, right? So just replace this with nine, two, or three instead of the eight here. So two and three are going to be what we were called direct color modes, and eight and nine are going to be in index color modes. So three is actually extraordinarily rare. So for the most part, you want to look out for two, eight, and nine. So what does index color mode mean? Um, so what does index color mode mean? So as you can see here, I have this computer monitor that has a bunch of pixels on the screen. 
Now, as you can see here, the pixels on the screen are referring to this table of colors here. And that's essentially what index color mode means. It indexes um, into a color palette that will contain the color that a particular pixel wants to display onto the screen. So instead of the traditional direct color mode where you tell each individual pixel um, in, in, in software exactly how much red, how much green, and how much blue you want it to be to display a color. Instead, you give it an index. So you say, this pixel here, I want you to go to index number five here, and I want you to display that color onto the screen. So instead of saying how much, you know, if I just want you to display red, instead you're saying, I want you to go to this palette entry here and display the color contained at that index. So it's sort of an intermediary layer to displaying colors. And the reason why you do it is because um, it's actually a lot more cheap to refer to this palette than to directly tell each individual pixel color what it can be, right? Because it means that I can just use this very small palette here to display a very small number of colors. So this here is 256 colors. Um, index color mode, you can try to be displayed over 65,000 colors, right? So it's just a bit cheaper to store, right? Um, in a file format, right? And so the index color mode, right? So you're going to refer to this palette, right? So this clut header is just going to contain the attributes to describe this palette, like what's the size of the palette? How many colors does it hold? How many palettes are used in this Tim image? Because a Tim image can hold multiple palettes that you know the image data can refer to. Then you're just going to go to the image header and then you're going to read the image data. Direct color mode, as I said before, is just going to be telling each individual pixel exactly what color you want it to be. Um, then you're just going to basically skip this intermediary layer and go straight to the image header and then read the image data. And so in a C um, level environment, this is a high level overview of what it could look like. So you're going to have 32 bit integers and 16 bit integers to represent four bytes or two bytes, right? So if you have a file here, the first thing you want to do is you're going to read a long value and this should be OX10. This should be your magic number. It should be this here in hex. This is what it should look like, right? And then you're going to read another long, and it's going to be your version. Now, this should be equal to OX2, OX3, OX8, and OX9, with OX3 being extraordinarily rare. So look out for 2, 8, and 9. And then if it's an index color mode, it's going to change how you're going to read the rest of the data. Because obviously, you're going to want to read the color palette data, right? You're going to read, it's going to tell you the size, the X and Y um, address of where you'd like to store it in the PlayStation um, 1's um, VRAM the number of colors, and then the number of color lookup tables, right? And you're going to read the color palettes, right, with the number of colors that each palette contains. Then, otherwise, if it's not in index color mode, you're just going to read the image size, which is going to be a long. You're going to read where you want to place it in the PlayStation 1's VRAM in the X and Y location in memory. You're going to have the width, the height, and you're going to read the image data, right? And so, interestingly enough, if you're in version 8, right, which is going to be a 4-bit per pixel, um, image, which means that it has a color palette of 16 colors, you're going to multiply the width by 4, and if it's OX9, which is going to be the 8-bit per pixel, which means that the color palette is going to be 256 colors in length, you're going to multiply the width by 2, and I think this has to do with the um, byte ordering of the PlayStation, how you want to align it in memory, and it's going to have padding, right, inside of the file, and it has to do with how you want to align things in memory, if I remember correctly. Now, I'm actually going to show you how we could potentially read a Tim. Now, again, I have an image library called Agital, right? I already have how to read and parse a Tim here, but I'm going to give you an example just in case you're unfamiliar with how we could potentially do this, implementing it using this high-level overview, right, of the C programming language. Now, I have a file that is called proc.tim. Let's analyze it in the hexadecimal editor real quickly, right? As you can see here, the first four bytes are indeed 10 right, this identifier, and then the version is 2, right? And so if we go back here, so the, the magic number is indeed a Tim, and its version is 2, which is going to be a direct color mode. And so this should indeed be a Tim. Regardless of what the file extension says, this is indeed formatted properly as a standard Tim image. So I'm going to go here into my text editor. I'm going to write a C program that's going to implement what I said before. As I say, we're going to need to be able to read along. So I'm going to pass in a file structure here. I'm going to declare 32-bit integers called read, initialize it to zero, pass it in. So it's going to return to us along, right? So let's just return read. 
then I'm going to need to be able to read a short or 16-bit integer value. So it's going to be similar to what I did there. So we're going to have, um, it's actually going to be 16-bit integer, read equals zero. So f read, I'm going to pass in read. It's going to be two one file, return read. Okay, so here we're going to declare a file structure, right? We're going to open it up and we're going to pass it in the croc.tim that we were just analyzing. And we're going to read it as a binary file. So remember to close your file stream so it doesn't lock access to your file, right? So the first thing that we need to do is we're going to read the magic number, right? So we're going to read the long. It's going to be a 32-bit number. And then we're going to read the version, right? I'm going to read the long here. Now, next, it's going to be the image size, because we don't have a color palette in this one. So we don't need to be worried about that. Now we're going to be dealing with short. So the mem address in X, I'm going to read a short. I'm going to read the memory address in the Y location to place it in the PlayStation 1's VRAM. Then we're going to get the width, right? It's going to be another short. And then we're going to get the height, right? Now, we're going to need to read the image data, right? So I'm going to call this image data. It's going to be a pointer. Because it's going to be variable length image data. We're not sure how big it is as long as the, as least as the program is concerned for now. So times width times height. Now let's read that image data. So we're going to do f read, pass in the image data. So it's going to be two bytes, right? 16 bit integers, then it's going to be width times height. Wow, right? So using my agile library, I want to convert it to a BMP so we can read it. So I'm going to create this BMP. I'm going to call it croc.bmp. It's going to be the width, the height, and the color formatting is going to be the PlayStation's RGB555 color space. So we're going to Flush the BMP, which is going to clear it to black. You don't have to necessarily do that. You can use the clear BMP, and then you can provide it a color. So we can do agital color 3F, and we can just provide it black. But you could just use flush if you just didn't care about the little tidbit, right? <laughs> so then we're going to um, sync these 16 bit per pixel entries into the BMP. We're going to flip the BMP horizontally. Trust me, it's the way that I export. You probably want to do that. So then we're going to export the BMP. And then we're going to free the BMP. Now we're going to free that image data that we no longer need. So this program should compile just fine. So let's go to CMD. Let's CD OneDrive slash desktop slash agital slash Agital make main CLS. All right, so let's check it out. And there we go. There's croc.bmp. This is what it stored. And here we go. It's simple as that, right? Now, again, if you want to learn how to read the others, again, here's Agital, you know, Tim. You know, you can go look at my image library. I discussed how to do it. It's open source, so you're free to use it. Um, just make sure to properly credit me. Of course, you don't have to. It just would be nice if you would. <laughs> um, you're under no obligation to do so. Um, okay, so now that we've done that, right, that now let's get to the most ideal scenario now that we know how to read Tim's, right? So I, if you don't have an actual PlayStation ROM, like Wipeout, like me or Bubsy 3D, I actually made this test ROM that shows us this pipe dream scenario that's called Need for Extraction Admin. It's formatted, you know, very similarly to how you would any retail PlayStation 1 game, right? So we're going to open up any burn, right? It's going to be our disk image extractor. And we're going to use the browse slash extract image file option, right? We want to select this image file. Need for extraction dot bin, open it up. It's going to allow us to view the contents. And as we can see here, in each one, there are a bunch of Tims here. We can go to character. There are a bunch of Tims here, a bunch of Tims here, right? This is, this is the ideal scenario where everything is stored in Tims. And you can go ahead and try this out and learn how to read them. So I'm going to take this background, for example, background.tim, backgrew.tim, right? Um, next, um, actually, I'd prefer you to store it. Where's, close that. Uh, desktop. Let's open up Agital. Store it there. 
just for the sake of example. And so let's go and analyze that real quick. Uh, here. So we have background. So let's open it up and let's analyze it to make sure that it is indeed a Tim. As you can see here, starts off with the proper identifier and a proper version too. It's the same one as before. All right, so if we come here, we can reuse what we did here. And we're going to, it was called backthrough.tim, I believe. And we're just gonna call this test.bmp. And this should all work the same. So we're gonna open up my command prompt again. So cd onedrive slash desktop slash agile slash agile make main. Okay, and it should show us this background, right? Because we can just reuse it. Because it's formatted the same exact way, right? And I took this from Resident Evil 2 because I own this ROM. So I just found this and was like, oh, my, I'm just I'm just gonna pour that in there real quick. <laughs> And um, that's the most ideal scenario. So if you wanted to see an example of an actual PlayStation ROM and whether or not it contains Tim's, so let's go back open, open up any burn browse slash extract image tool, right? So instead, let's go to Wipeout. This is my backup of it. Before I actually load in the CD-ROM in the beginning of the video, but I'm on my modern laptop here. I'm not going to be using my crusty laptop. That was just for the retro programming vibes. Where is it? Wipeout, Wipeout. Here it is. So let's open up the bin here. Now, Wipeout isn't in the ideal format, but there is one folder that's mostly in the ideal format, and that is the textures file. This contains a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of Tim's that we want, right? Now, I actually don't know what all of these are. I'm gonna take out wipe title, I guess. This this seems good as any. Um, again, let's open up desktop, agital, agital. Next. Okay, so let's go back. So I'm going to analyze it just to make sure it's properly formatted. Let's see. Okay, it's formatted the same way. So there's no color lookup table because I would actually have to use my actual Tim library for that if it were. So it's called wipe title, I believe. I'm just going to replace it with test. Let's go CMD. CD desktop. Oh, OneDrive. Sorry. OneDrive slash desktop slash agital slash agital make main. Okay. Oh, I didn't like that very much. Whip title. Oh, I probably couldn't read it. It's whip title, right? Whip title, my bad. There we go. And here it is. Right? That's the most ideal scenario for a game like, you know, Wipeout with that particular folder where everything is stored in a format that we can read it in. Right? So that means that we don't need to do any extra work. We just need to drag and drop and, and, and just convert. Right? Drag, drop, convert. That's by far the most ideal scenario. Um, let's see. Let's open up. Let's see. What else do we have here? Some of these are not going to be formatted uh, before. Some of them may, may have color palettes. In fact, this one here, smoke.tim, probably has a color palette. So just for the sake of example, I'm going to show you that. Uh, desktop. Agital, agital. Store it there, please. Not sure if it actually did. <laughs> Let's go back here. Hopefully it did. Okay, it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> right. Oh, no, here it is, smoke.tim. Let's see. Yep, this is going to be the 256 color palette. So in order to do this, what I'm gonna have to do, um, let me remove this for a second. I'm actually just going to open up an image struct here. Um, so here's how I would do it in Agital, just for the sake of example. So I'm gonna declare Tim equals Agital load Tim. What was it called? Smoke.tim, I believe. So we're going to do agital BMP, BMP equals agital convert Tim to BMP, pass in the Tim. We're going to export the BMP. We're going to free the BMP. 
and then we're going to free the Tim. So make main. Okay, let's see what we're dealing with here. Here's smoke.bmp. So it is color palleted, right? So if you come here to smoke.tim, it has the proper identifier. It's a 256 color palette. I believe then it's followed by the clut size. This is going to be where to find it in memory. And it's going to be like the width and the height or something, and then the rest of the data, right? However, I specified earlier. And here's what the little image looks like. Smoke, apparently. OK, so again, that would be the most ideal scenario. Let's move into level two. This is going to be the second most ideal scenario. So let's move on to level two. And I've promptly named this all is not as it may seem. And this is essentially where all or most sprites and textures in a PlayStation 1's ROM are disguised Tims or headerless Tims. What does this mean? Let me give you an example. I have a bit of data that I've extracted from Resident Evil 2's ROM, and it has um, a lot of weird files. So it has these DO2 files, this disguised file that's called files.tim. Um, again, all is not as it may seem. I'll get to that later. It has an ITB, a PIX file, and a PMLW. Now, these DO2 files are essentially contain TIMs. Now, again, like I said, the file extension um, of a TIM doesn't matter whatsoever. As long as the contents of a file are properly formatted as a TIM, it's a TIM. For example, if I come here to smoke.tim, right? Let's say I renamed it to smoke.headerless, right? Will this all of a sudden change the contents of its file? No. In fact, if I load it here as headerless, um, smoke.headerless, this will still treat, you know, at least my library will still treat it as any other Tim. Because as long as it's properly formatted as such, it really shouldn't matter in the long run. So let's go here. Well, I need to delete this, but now let's run main. And there we go. It still treats it all the same as long as it's properly formatted as such. So let's analyze this DO2 file that we have here, right? So let's come here. So it does have a bunch of metadata that is unrelated to us, but it does contain a Tim. Again, if we go to, so what I did, I click Control F, it's just the find. So if you go to search and find, um, I'm gonna look for the hex value 10, right? This is going to tell me that it has the proper ID of a Tim, right? And here we go. So here's our version 9, which I believe is going to be the 8-bit um, the per pixel image, right? So 10, 9, this is going to be the color palette size. So even though it's not stored directly where we want it, we could treat it like um, a normal Tim. So we could, here's one thing we could do. We could load up all this file, skip to this address here, ignore all the data, load all the contents and store it as a proper as a proper tim or we could use um a more advanced extraction method but i'm not going to go into that right now because i want to show you a little bit about how we could approach extracting this data now that we know that this is where a tim is stored right it's only one tim all the rest is metadata so again at 5, at OX5 BB0, this is where we're looking for. But just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to show you what I mean. So I have this function that's called Agital Tim Search File on Disk. So it should be in RE2 Image Data, I believe, slash door 00. zero. Do2, and then I'm gonna I want to store it as a BMP image, and I want it to be horizontally flipped. And this should you know work quite well at, at doing what I wanted it to do. So let's run main. Okay, so it should have found it. Not sure where it stored it though. Oh here, here it is. So yeah, it found it. 
So essentially what that function did was that it essentially went through the contents of the file and it continuously kept searching through the file until it found the proper Tim header with the proper version and it loaded in that image data for me. So the way that we can do this here is again, if we have a file here, file, file equals open. So what was it called again? So it's gonna be in re2 image data slash, what was it called? Door 2 and I read it as a binary. So we're gonna use FC. So we're gonna pass in our file. What's What was our offset? It was OX something. <laughs> My memory isn't the greatest. Um, okay. So let me find where that is in search all. So five, db0 so instead i'm going to start here at 5 b a 5 b a f 5 b a f then we're going to seek set so we're going to start from the beginning of the file and so if we do that that's essentially where our tim header stored so we can just read it as um a normal Tim, right? So we could do U16 here, right? I'm sorry, U32. Wait, it was stored as a color palette entry. Darn, I didn't want to work on a color palette entry. Well, just for the sake of example, um, that's normally how you could do it. I just don't feel like going through all that trouble. Use my image library to learn how to how to do that. I have the functionality for you. Let's, I need to, you know, this video is getting kind of long, you know, I gotta speed it up a bit, but that's how you would do that. So there's this other file that's called files.tim. Now, the reason why I said that it's not all as it may seem is that this is actually an archive. In fact, I would be very skeptical when I saw that this thing was 5,000 kilobytes and I'm expected that it only contains one Tim. Yeah, bull, bull. I don't know how many Tims it contains, but I promise you, if we do, if we search up our hex values, OX10, search all, how many times does it have TIM data here, right? 256. Not all of these are proper TIMs, but a lot of these do store TIMs, right? So this is one example of Oz as it not may seem. So let me bring up this TIM again. So we're going to, it was called files.tim, right? And this is a clear example of all that it may not be seen. This is an archival format that tries to masquerade as a proper Tim. So it's going to come here and find all of these for us. Yeah, and here you can see it tried to trick us, bro. It tried to dupe us. Here's all the text and all, you know, if you played RE2, this is all the text that you'll find in all the entries, all the little booklets and stuff like that. So it masquerades itself. Um as one Tim, right? Again, it's being a little bit mischievous there, but it's not. It's actually an archival format. And you would be none the wiser, but just for the sake of example, I'm actually gonna go delete all these because this is gonna be wildly annoying to have to find what I need. Boink. I'm gonna actually show you how to read an archival format or a high level overview. So if we come back to my number here, so essentially, the first, so we're going to need two while loops. So while, you know, not FEOF file, right? So while we haven't reached the end of the file, we're essentially going to want to declare a Tim, right? So we're going to say agital Tim Tim equals, um, we're just going to pass this to a Tim. We're going to malloc size of Tim. This is like very specific C language stuff, but the point here is that we're going to give it memory so it can load a Tim. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do Tim decode header. So the first thing we're going to do is going to decode the header of the Tim, right? So if this is not properly a Tim, here's what we're going to do. So we're going to say while not in the file, we're going to make sure that we haven't reached the end of the file, right? Otherwise we want to close the stream. And um, agital and not agital is Tim. 
So if this isn't properly formatted as a Tim, we're going to want to keep track of where we are. So we're going to call this count and we're just going to make it equal to um, ftel, which will tell us where we are, where we are currently in the file, right? Then we're going to want to do fseek. So file count minus seven. Why the particular number seven? So if you think about it in a file, right? You have 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, and let's just say you had nine, for example, right? So this is what happens when it decodes header. It tries to read the first eight bytes, and it tries to see, sorry, it's the first four bytes of this um, identifier, and it's the rest of the four bytes, um, you know, is it one of the proper versions? If not, right, we're going to essentially want to start from here. So we're going to want to move back seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Start here, read in another group of eight bytes. If it's not a Tim header, we're going to move back seven, start from here, read another group of eight bytes. And it's a very slow process in the grand scheme of things because we want to be as thorough as possible, right? We want to be as thorough as possible. And then here we're going to do decode header again. And it's going to rinse and repeat until it finds a Tim. Once it does that, we're going to call agile Tim decode um, image. This is, I think, how I properly put in Agile. And then we're going to do and do X, whatever else, right? And that's a high-level overview of how that would work. Um, and I believe this IPX, which doesn't even, you wouldn't think that that is um, a container file either. But this is actually, I believe, also a container file. So ITPS that ITP. So we're going to come here, Agile Tim, search file on disk what's it oh are you to image data slash i t p s i t p s that i t p i believe i'm gonna want it to be bmps please flip it it's me okay let's make and let's see what we can find and here we go. These are all of the UI for the game here, right? If you play Resident Evil 2, you should recognize all of these, right? Okay. And so yeah, it's not as all not as all as it may seem, right? You never know what um it could contain. So moving on to level three. Wait, there's one more I wanted to show you. Right. This is a headerless Tim. This is something that is not formatted as Tim image data, but is indeed a Tim. This is really interesting. So I have here this copyright.image. Now I found this in Croc Legend of the Gobos. Now I was, you know, a bit skeptical at first because it has an image, right? A dot image extension, right? So it should be an image, right? But it also could be a disk image, lies it here. It identifies this as a disk image, in fact. But I did a bit more digging and I was like, okay, so it's an image and it's called copyright. Therefore I'm assuming it's something that's played at the beginning of the game just to say, hey, don't bring this anywhere. Don't like steal my content, whatever, whatever the case may be, right? That's what it does. That's what I assumed. So I opened it up in a hex editor. So, okay, so I looked to see if it was formatted as a Tim. It wasn't formatted as a Tim. There was nothing that identified it. But this is where I got a bit more clever. So I decided to say, okay, so it's not properly formatted as a Tim, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't hold image data. So what I did was I, I said, okay, so if it is displayed at the beginning of some sort of game, um, most the resolution of most PlayStation 1 games are 320 by 240. And so I tried that out, 320 by 240, and I thought that it would be a still image. And what that means is that, you know, as I said before, the 24-bit per pixel image is extremely rare among PlayStation titles because geometric primitives in the PlayStation 1 GPU cannot be drawn in 24-bit per pixel mode. So only steel images or FMV sequences can be displayed that way. So I said that it probably contains 16-bit per pixel data, right? So two bytes. So therefore, if this is true, the file size should be 153,600 bytes. And hmm, what would you know if we check the properties? Hmm, this is starting to become very fascinating to me. So I decided to hop into an emulator that's called No Cache PSX. And when this copyright image came up, it did identify it. It was directly blitted to the um from the PlayStation 1's VRAM to the screen, right? As 320 by 240. 
So here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare a file and we're going to open it up and it's going to be called re2 image data slash what was it called it was called copyright dot image we're going to read it as a binary file so it only contains 320 by 240 image data right so we can skip the headers entirely right it just straight up contains image data so we're going to cast it properly size of u16 times 320 by 240. we know that it's this height right we know for a fact that it's 320 by 240. so we're gonna again create an instance of my agile bmp and we're gonna call it copyright.bmp it's gonna be 320 by 240 it's going to be in the RGB555 color space. I'm going to do agital BMP sync pick 16. So we're going to put in this image data. Again, <laughs> I'm going to flip the image horizontally because the way that it exports is very bad. I'll probably change it eventually. Um, then we're going to export the BMP as usual. And then we're going to free that image data. And then we're going to close that file stream. And this should work. Oh, right. Sorry. I said agile create BMP. That was in my bad. Happens. Okay. CLS main. Okay. So let's see if my hypothesis was correct. Copyright.bmp. Oh, wait. I did a no no. I actually know why why I did a no-no here. Um I flipped it, I freed it. Create BMP 320 by 240. Right, what am I doing? I forgot to read it into the file. Okay, I'm losing it right now. I knew I forgot something. Something wasn't wasn't making sense to me. Let's just make this real quick main cls and here it is it's the croc.bmp from earlier i uh -huh, got y'all this is what it was all along this is where i got it from and i had a huge aha moment because i'm not like the greatest reverse engineer not even close but this was a big moment for me because i'm like this is what i meant by all is what it you know not may seem or whatever i said english you know all is not what it may appear to be at first right and this is a clear example of that um and that is essentially level two. That's all it's not, you know, all it's not as it may seem. Now, the third um, type that we could be is where we're not, this is not the most ideal scenario. In fact, um, I meant to change this and I'm going to do it in real time because I'm tired of editing this video. It's going to be, and I already put it here and I'm going to call it a somewhat ideal scenario. <laughs> okay and this is where all or most bryson textures are stored in a tim field archival format so one game that a hundred percent of the graphics are stored in a um archival format they're all tims every single last texture and sprite is a tim but it's stored in archival format is a playstation title called colony wars red sun i mean it's called colony wars the first entry into the series now, I'm a big fan of Psygnosis games, as you can tell. And again, I extracted it here, and it's called a game.resource. In fact, it is primarily, if you go here to my Agital examples here, the main example of me using this tool here to extract the Tim image data and archive, right, from a file, you know, this is the main example that I show here, and this shows an angel T pose. And so this is the third you know, best scenario. And it's when everything is sort of in an archival format. So everything is Tim's. It's not headerless Tim's. It's not um, a ghost Tim's or, or the disguised Tim's. Everything is a Tim, but it's stored inside of an archive. So we're going to come here to our handy dandy text editor that we've been using. And we're going to call agile Tim search file on disk, right? So we're going to load in game.resource. Again, I want it to be a BMP, 
and I want it to be horizontally flipped. So let's make main. So let's let it go and cook up. Let's see what it'll find for us. Okay, here it's loaded some up. And I believe this thing is gonna find like over a thousand Tims, like every single sprite and texture is stored in this archival format. Yeah, it's just going through an exhaustive search. I do a brute force search, right? So I check every single last byte to see if it can contain the Tim image data that I'm looking for. Like I leave nothing to chance, right? Okay, it's starting to load in a lot now. Here we can see the T pose in image. Um, and you know this is a great game to use this technique on because every single Tim in this game is here. I've extracted every. There, there's no stone unturned. It, it finds everything. Everything is here. Um. It's quite impressive, you know, you can see all of these Tims, you know, you can see um, these are probably for ship designs. Some of these were made to be put in certain places on side of certain ships. Some of these are icons here that you may find throughout the game. Don't know why there's an Angel T posing, but I'm sure it's for something. We can see more data. Uh, we can see actually a PlayStation controller here, right? You can see the buttons here. Cool, cool. I wonder if they have the full controller somewhere, or if it's just like the buttons. I don't know what this is, though. This looks like it's something for the PlayStation, but I don't actually know what this is. Okay, let's keep going through. It's found, I would roughly say, Yep, it's found over, oh my god, 1,185 Tims. And that's all the textures for the game here. In plain of view sight. Um, obviously, I'm not just going to let this lie here. Um, I'm going to delete all of these. Um, <laughs> that should be pretty clear. But you can just go ahead and look at them if you want while I'm scrolling up. Oh my god, this was a lot. Um, please let me get to top soon. First one. P please go. Thank you. Oh my god, how many megabytes of data is that? Jeez, it started off at like 15 megs of straight image data. Which roughly, it's the similar to how the, it would have probably only been like, I'm not sure how big this original file was. It wasn't that big though. Jesus, uh, around 11 megabytes of straight data. Yeah, a BMP's header is like quite a bit larger than that of a Tim on average. So that's why it was stored in a little bit less in here compared to when I extracted it in a BMP. Okay, so the next most ideal, well, no, this is actually where we're getting into, again, if we go to the levels here, the next level here, this is where we're getting, this is starting to get into hard. What we just came across was medium, right? The archival format, like I said whoa, a long time ago. Now we're getting into hard territory. And this next level is when all or most textures are stored in a non-archival format. Thank God, right? But they're not stored in TIMS, and they're not stored in any file format that's easy to do. So just like this copyright.tim that we found here, this copyright.image, it's not a TIM, but it is image data that the PlayStation can read, but it's not in the TIM. So we're, we have to reverse engineer the file format, essentially. And a perfect game for this, I would think, is the Wipeout title that I said before. Again, I showed you one instance of um, one of its folders that held the data that we were looking for. but if we go to any burn here, we go to browse slash extract image, right? And if we go to wipeout.bin, the vast majority of these are stored, um, if we look in common, or in the CMP file. These CMP files are actually just compressed TIM, um, compressed TIMs. I believe that it uses the LZ77 compression scheme, which is very different from RLE, which is the one that I was most accustomed to before as, you know, compressing image data. Um, you know, we can go to track and they'll have all these CMPs, these text files, <laughs> latex, no, that's not what it is, but okay. Has the, a bunch of CMPs, these text files, right? And I did a bit of research again, using, you know, your brain, everyone should, you know, learn how to research things because some things are not that difficult or they've already been discovered before, you know, someone's already laid the ground works for you. And I found an example of someone decompressing the CMP files here. So this here will decompress the files here. It'll depack them and it'll parse these um, files here, right? It'll parse the 
So yeah, you can save the file here, right? And they'll be in the Tim format. So they're just compressed Tims. It is Tim image data, but it's compressed here. And there, and here's the, um, and I'll, I guess I'll post this PDF. I mean, I don't have the link anymore. I found it from the Wayback Machine. I guess this is the link that you can find it in. But again, I'll share this PDF so you can learn how to do it yourself. Um, and this is the, again, second mo most, um, or the second most unideal scenario where nothing is stored as a BMP, but it is stored as Tim image data, but it's stored compressed or just in a non Tim format. Um, but let's get to the least ideal scenario. Um, and I want to get into that. And this is where something is stored in an archival format in a non Tim image, you know, file format. Um, and essentially, the way that we're going to um, solve this problem is via high-level emulation. Um, so if you think about it, um, if I came here, right? So essentially, no matter what, this image data that's stored inside of this file has to be sent to the PlayStation 1's GPU, right? I said earlier here that essentially what a Tim does is that it'll, you know, pipeline its graphics data directly to the PlayStation 1's GPU. So we can make a lot of assumptions about files, right? So any file, I've always said any image is usually going to contain a width, a height, an optional color palette with an in-length amount of image data. And it's usually going to have some sort of header, right? That's going to contain a magic number, whatever the case may be. So these are the assumptions that we can make about a file. Now, this image data, right, this in-length image data is usually going to be sent to the PlayStation as a 16-bit, you know, um, array of data, right, or a pointer in this case in C, right, because we want it to be variable length. You know? We don't want it to be static, right? We want to be able to change it. And again, this is going to be the image data, right? And it has to be sent, you know, it's going to be send to the PlayStation 1's GPU. Right, so we're gonna give it some source address, right? Some source address. And then we're gonna send it to the GPU's memory, right? If we just had to think about it that way. So instead, let me just reference them like this. So let's just say this is what we had to do, you know? And so usually it's going, you're gonna use, you're gonna see some high level sprites. So let's just say they have a sprite, sprite. They're gonna use like CD-ROM load file, right? They're going to pass in some file, and then they're going to call send to PS1 GPU. It's going to pass in the sprite, the sprite's address, um, right? They're going to send in the sprite.image data, right? And then they're going to send it off to the PlayStation 1's GPU memory, right? The memory address. And so essentially why emulators solve this problem is because essentially they track all of these calls, right? And they're going to essentially find out where this image data is stored. It's going to get the memory address, right? Read that image data. And it's going to essentially intercept these calls, these high-level function calls in C, and essentially store them and send them out to OpenGL or another sort of graphics library that can then put it inside of an image file. So I'm gonna show you the avocado emulator. So if we come here to my resource extraction tools, I'm gonna to use the avocado emulator to show you an example. So here I believe, oh, it's Silent Hill. Pause it for example. Let me show you Wipeout. Um, let me get my Wipeout here. Uh, me close some of these out so I can actually get to it. So let me load in wipe out here. Uh, fast boot, please. And so essentially, if you come here to its GPU log, you can always check what it's you know what's being sent directly to it, right? It's always sending in these commands. Or if you look at the um, GTE log, you can always see things like that. So I want to get into a game really quick. 
Oh, wait, I need to load in my controller for a second. Okay, give me a second real time here for me to actually load my controller. Okay. Avocado, open yourself up again. Okay. Hold on, I know I know what's going on. Um let me open up this other backup of Wipeout that I have. Again, that one may have been slightly corrupted fast boot. So let's load this in. I uh, don't care, don't care, don't care. And so, as I said before, it can track all of what's going on, right? You can check the GTE logs. You can check what's going on in the GPU, seeing what is going on here. See the polygons that it's trying to draw, the all the other graphics primitives. I'm just going to go here and take a 3D screenshot. So let's go check that out. So if we go to my Windows, um, Users, Ryan D, let's go to Desktop. And there we go. High-level emulation kind of took everything that it saw, and it took all these high-level um, calls, and it just saved them and exported it to a BMP or a PNG image in this case, right? And this is essentially what high-level emulation can do. Um, if all goes wrong if everything is not what we want it to be you know nothing's stored inside of a 10 image file you don't want to have to go through the burden of having to reverse engineer all of these image file formats this is a very convenient method you know using high level emulation to solve your problems and that is essentially all of the bases on how to extract from a software developer's perspective at the very least how to extract image data from places in one's rom so level one again is the pipe dream everything is stored in tims tims galore right Two is when everything is not as it may seem. Everything is stored in disguised TIMS. It's formatted as TIMS, but the file extensions may not be that, or it may be stored in partial archives, or has like some sort of meta file data that we don't really know what it means, but it does have a TIM stored inside of the file. Next is when all of the TIMS of the entire game are stored inside of a huge archive of TIMS, right? Like um, Colony Wars. And then we're getting into the difficult territory where we covered if everything is stored inside of non-TIMS, like the wipeout and the CMP, and worse comes to shove, if nothing is stored in the file format that we want, you don't have to go through the burden of reverse engineering, we use high-level emulation to solve all of our problems. And that's the video, so thank you. Um, hope you like, share, subscribe. This is by far the most advanced video I've come. I mean, I'm not going to lie. In terms of videos, I usually make shovelware, but I actually wanted to make something quite sophisticated and educational, you know, this time. So thank you.